Hey everybody, Johnny the Queer Potus here, and I've finally gotten around to it. I'm finally doing a video about our first president, George Washington. To be honest, I never really studied Washington that much, but recently I've been digging into his early years, and I've learned something pretty astounding about him. Did you know that George Washington once started a world war? That's right, in 1754, when George Washington was a colonel in the British Army, that's why I got this red coat, he was the chief player in an incident that caused the French and Indian War, which itself sparked a global conflict called the Seven Years' War. In this video, we'll separate fact from fiction, dig into the primary sources, and see if we can find an answer to the question, did George Washington really start a world war? As always, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now, and support us on patreon.com, links in the description below. All right, let's get into it. Our discussion begins with a 2006 PBS documentary about the French and Indian War. The film opens with a 22-year-old Colonel Washington commanding a small unit of British soldiers and Indian allies. He's ambitious, but still unsure of himself. Marching through the woods of western Pennsylvania, he comes upon a unit of 30 or so French-Canadian troops. Rousing his soldiers, he quietly advances on them. Then, Washington steps on a twig, the French grab their guns, and the game is on. The battle lasts only a few minutes, and the French quickly surrender. But it's what happens next that shocks the young colonel. As the wounded writhe in pain, a French civilian informs Washington that one of the wounded men is actually an envoy on a peaceful mission. While the French brandish papers proving their story, Washington's Indian ally, a Senecan chief named Tana Charison, known as the Half King, hatchets the envoy to death. Washington stands by helplessly as the Indians murder the remaining wounded and take their scalps. Washington realizes he's been used by Tana Charison, but it's already too late. The damage has been done. The cycle of retaliation spreads. Soon, fighting breaks out all across the continent. What history remembers as the French and Indian War lasts five years, but it will only be one theater in a much larger war. France and Britain sink so much money and manpower into the conflict that they begin to fight each other back home in Europe. And later, they do get out in the colonies, in India and Indonesia, and all over the world. The war becomes known as the Seven Years' War. And according to this documentary, it all happens because of the actions of an inexperienced colonel named George Washington. Oh my God! Great job. Documentaries are not always the best place to get your information. Artistic license often gets in the way of historical fact. So in this next section of the video, I'm gonna take a look at what actually happened based on a collection of sources which I have left for you in the description below. At the time of this story, George Washington was only 21 years old. He just scored an appointment as a district adjutant in the Virginia militia the rank of Major. Major Washington joined the British Army at a critical moment in the history of North America. It was 1753, and tensions between the French and British were rapidly growing. Both empires controlled sizable areas of land on the continent, the British colonies hugging the Atlantic shore, the French in Canada and west along the Mississippi. Both traded and concluded treaties with Indian groups. The Indians relied on the plentiful trade provided by European settlers, and would regularly take sides in the conflicts between the French and the British. Confederacies like the Iroquois and Huron, for example, allied with the French to help them dominate their own enemies, such as the Seneca and the Shawnee. The Seneca allied with the British in order to fight back against the Iroquois and Huron. What set the stage for the events covered in this video was a dramatic increase in French settlement of the Ohio Valley, Western Pennsylvania, and Western New York. Where exactly was the boundary between British and French territory? That question was becoming ever more pressing. 
British king, King George II, tried to stem the tide of incoming French by allocating a sizable grant for rapid settlement of the region. Washington's half-brother, Lawrence, was among those who lobbied for the construction of a fort and trading post in western Pennsylvania. And before long, a site known as the Forks of the Ohio was chosen, now modern-day Pittsburgh. As the meeting place of three rivers, it was a perfect spot to build a hub for interstate travel and commerce. British soldiers moved quickly to secure permission to use the land from their Indian allies. A Seneca chief named Tonacharison, also known as the Half King, concluded a treaty with the British, assuring them the land was his to give away. But the French had Indian allies of their own, who weren't going to let the Seneca decide the fate of the Forks. Time was of the essence, and the British moved fast to settle the land before the French challenged their claim. In the late fall of 1753, Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie called on Major Washington to march up to the Forks, pick out the best spot to build a fort, then march further north to Fort Leboeuf and issue an ultimatum to the French. Vacate all British territory or face military action. The journey proved grueling, with winter snows caked in mud and ice rain plaguing the troops. As Washington passed into Pennsylvania, he made first contact with the Seneca, Delawares, and Shawnee. At Logstown on November 22, 1753, he summoned Tonacharison, the half-king, offering him a tuft of tobacco and a string of wampum. Wampums were ornate belts sewn to commemorate the formation of an alliance. Washington and Tanacharison more or less hit it off, and the half-king even coined a nickname for him, Kanotakarius, Devourer of Towns. Washington likely found the nickname flattering, coming from a great warrior like the half-king. But Tanacharison's alliance with Major Washington was not based in sentimentality. The half-king hated the French and their Indian allies to the north and wanted them gone. Washington's letters at the time suggest he also understood his friendship with the half-king to be transactional in nature. The Indians are mercenary. Every service of theirs must be purchased, and they are easily offended, being thoroughly sensible of their own importance. The half-king and a small group of scouts and warriors accompanied Washington on the journey northward. Along the way, they came upon a cabin where some French officers were stationed. Washington dined with the French soldiers that evening and was privy to some disturbing intelligence. The wine, as they dosed themselves plentifully with it, soon banished restraint which at first appeared in their conversation and gave license to their tongues to reveal their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio. Washington pushed onto Fort Leboeuf and delivered Governor Dinwiddie's ultimatum. The French commander at the fort was unmoved, but offered the young major a bed for the night. The next morning, as Washington began to march back to Virginia, his Indian allies refused to join him. As it turned out, the French had convinced the half-king to abandon Washington in exchange for weapons and other supplies. Washington was enraged, but there was little he could do. Now he had a long journey ahead with no guide. Struggling through freezing winter temperatures and unfriendly landscapes, Washington managed to get back to Williamsburg, Virginia by mid-January 1754. Meeting with Governor Dinwiddie, he delivered the sealed letter as well as detailed specs of all the French fortifications he encountered along the way. Dinwiddie sent a long report back to London, detailing Washington's findings and recounting the harrowing stories the young major had relayed to him. The report was later published as a pamphlet entitled The Journal of Major Washington, complete with tales of exotic Indians, scurrilous Frenchmen, and heroic adventures fording icy rivers and marching across dangerous landscapes It became a sensation, especially in London, where it was eagerly read by young children dreaming of adventure out west. It was Washington's first mission, and already a mythology was developing around him. The expedition would also give Washington his first taste of what he would come to hate most about serving the British, the meager pay. Governor Dinwiddie paid Washington a mere 50 pounds for his trouble amounting to a reimbursement for all expenses incurred during the trip. Over the years, Washington would come to resent his treatment in the British Army. 
and after the French and Indian War, he quit the military altogether and went back home to manage his slave plantations full time. This made him a free agent in 1775 when the Continental Congress called him up to lead the Revolutionary Army against the British. But that was still decades into the future. At this point in his life, he could do little more than grumble, which he did in just about every letter to Governor Dinwiddie during those years. On the bright side, Washington's reputation as a soldier was growing, and Governor Dinwiddie soon dispatched him on another mission. This time, Washington demanded a promotion to Lieutenant Colonel with all pay and privileges due him before taking the commission, and Dinwiddie agreed. Colonel Washington's second mission would see the stakes significantly raised. By this point, tensions between the French and British were reaching a breaking point. Dinwiddie decided to send Colonel Washington into Pennsylvania as soon as possible to build a fort. Intelligence reports suggested the French and Iroquois were already preparing attacks. There was no time to lose. As Washington left Williamsburg, he was given express permission by the governor to use deadly force. You are to restrain all offenders and in case of resistance to make prisoners or kill and destroy them. Washington's company arrived at the Forks of the Ohio in the late spring months of 1754. The French had been busy since his last visit. Despite the British treaty with the Half King, a superior force of French soldiers had taken the forks and kicked the British out. They then built a huge fort on the site and named it Fort Duquesne. Washington immediately penned letters to the governors of Pennsylvania and Maryland, imploring them to send him reinforcements for an assault on the newly built French fort. On May 24th, Washington received reports that a French detachment of unknown size was heading towards his position. He decided to entrench his soldiers at a spot called Great Meadows and wait for a French attack. One evening, as the soldiers slept, they thought they heard a shot ring out in the woods. Scouts reported seeing a handful of Frenchmen in the distance who ran off. Washington set out with a party of about 70 soldiers to investigate. They marched for miles into the woods until they came upon an encampment of about 35 French Canadians. Washington's letter to Governor Dinwiddie of the following day describes what happened next. When we came to the half king, I counseled with him and got his assent to go hand in hand and strike the French. I thereupon in conjunction with the half king and Monocatucha formed a disposition to attack them on all sides which we accordingly did, and after an engagement of about 15 minutes, we killed 10, wounded one, and took 21 prisoners. Amongst those that were killed was Monsieur de Humonville, the commander. This is the same Monsieur de Humonville who would turn out to be the French envoy carrying a message to the Virginian governor. According to PBS, the death of this man at the hands of the half-king is the final straw for France. In light of this fact, PBS proposes that the entire incident was part of an elaborate plan set in motion by the Half-King to force the British into war with France. If the Half-King orchestrates a confrontation between the British and the French, it will strengthen his own hand in the region. Washington's skirmish alone probably would not have triggered a larger war, but the cold-blooded murder of their wounded officer the French couldn't possibly let that go without a response. What's weird about this explanation is that it all hinges on the half-king slaying the envoy, but nothing in any of Washington's accounts mention anything about who killed Humonville. One of Washington's later accounts does describe Indians walking through the camp, killing and scalping the wounded. But this behavior was typical of Indian warfare, and we don't know whether Humonville was specifically killed by one of the Indians in this manner. It's true that the half-king was willing to provoke a confrontation between the British and the French, but it's not clear that he or anyone at Humonville Glen understood that this one incident could be the spark that lit the continent on fire. The idea that it was a thoroughly planned conspiracy sounds a little far-fetched to me. So where did the story that the half-king killed the envoy come from? To be honest, I had a lot of trouble finding the answer. I first turned to Ron Chernow, the guy who wrote, 
Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. The book. In his biography of Washington, he says, According to one account, as Jumonvi read his message, the half-king stepped forward, split open his head with a hatchet, then dipped his hands into the skull, rinsed with the victim's brains, and scalped him. According to what account, exactly? Cherno lists the source as a four-volume George Washington biography written in the 1960s. 21st century authors citing 20th century authors about an 18th century event. Well, I couldn't find the book on the free library, but I found a similar book by the same author called George Washington, The Forge of Experience. I didn't find anything like what Cherno had printed, but I did come across this interesting tidbit. After the battle, the half-king and his braves demanded, with explosive gutturals and with imperious motions of hands already dangling bloody scalps, that the Frenchmen be given up to them. As for the enemy officers who were still upright, they were orating in what sounded most strangely like indignation. One produced a pouch, perhaps by darting over to a corpse and pulling it from among the bloody clothes, took out some papers and waved them in Washington's face. Soon, a minimum of three interpreters were shouting at Washington. When the confusion had died down a little, Washington discovered ten Frenchmen, including the commander, Joseph Coulon, Sieur de Jumonville, had been killed, and that he had 22 prisoners. It also became clear that he was being accused of murdering ambassadors. So Flexner paints for us a very confusing scene, one where the timing of events isn't perfectly clear. The half-king's warriors scalping the wounded, papers being shoved in Washington's face. The best this author can say is that when the confusion died down, Humonville lay dead. And what source is he using in his account? Why, another book he wrote, of course. Just so happens to be the same book Cherno was referencing. <sighs> We're going in circles. And this is a great time to remind you all to become a supporter of this channel on Patreon.com so I can afford to procure texts like these and give you better answers than I'm able to give you in this video. Well, since we've backed into a corner, let's just try a basic internet search, though the sourcing is almost always totally dubious. Here's what the National Park Service has to say on the incident. Reports from both sides agree on how Jumonville died. Jumonville was wounded during the skirmish. Then, when the fighting ceased, one of Washington's allies, the Seneca leader named the Half-King, killed the French ensign with a tomahawk to the skull. The sources provided at the bottom look rather scattershot. An encyclopedia here, some other person's book there. Where did they get the primary sources behind these claims? Smithsonian.com put a bit more work into their article on the subject. According to French accounts, Jumonville had tried to get the British to stop firing so he could speak to them. One report even claimed that Jumonville had been shot through the head while one of his fellow soldiers was in the process of reading a message to the British. The French portrayed Washington's ambush as the brutal murder of a diplomatic official. Some sources, including a British newspaper, reported that Tanagreson himself had killed Jumonville. One telling of that story by a British deserter added an especially brutal twist. As Jumonville lay wounded after the battle, Tanagreson approached him and remarked, Tu n'es pas encore mort, mon père. You are not yet dead, my father. Tu n'es pas encore mort, mon père. What Smithsonian.com identifies as an exaggerated report from a British newspaper PBS portrays as fact. The sources PBS uses were the vestiges of a propaganda war between the British and the French. One where the French were eager to portray George Washington as a butcher of innocent men, and the British were eager to blame the whole thing on the savagery of Indians. It doesn't mean that all of these accounts are bogus, it just means that one account should not be automatically presented as fact, end of story. One possible early source of the version where it's all the half-king's fault comes from Governor Dinwiddie. In his report to the British royal government about the incident, he writes, The little skirmish was by the half-king and the Indians. We were auxiliaries to them, as my order to the commander of our forces was to be on the defensive. But wait, 
Didn't Governor Dinwiddie authorize Washington to use deadly force before setting off on the expedition? You are to restrain all offenders and in case of resistance to make prisoners or kill and destroy them. Was Dinwiddie just trying to cover his protege's ass? Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that question. But we do know that days before the incident, Washington was eager to go into battle with the French. Writing to Maryland Governor Horatio Sharp, Washington expressed hopes that escalating tensions between the French and British would rouse the heroic spirit of every freeborn Englishman to assert the rights and privileges of our king and wrest from the invasions of the usurping enemy, our majesty's property, his dignity, and lands. In the end, I wasn't able to fully piece together what exactly happened that day. Not one source, whether biography, letters, or accounts from those involved, or even various internet publications, seem to completely agree with one another. Personally, I found the version written in the book Blooding at Great Meadow by Alan Axelrod to be the most reasonable. Alan Axelrod argues that Washington's Indian allies began the customary executions of wounded Frenchmen during the course of battle and continued for some while after the battle ended. Whether Humonville was killed by a bullet from a British gun or an Indian's hatchet is not known. The half-king had been beating the war drum against the French for a long time and had plenty of reason to try and trick Washington into causing a war. But Washington was just as war-hungry as the half-king. Axelrod describes the relationship between the half-king and Washington in a very interesting way. In short, the two allies simultaneously overestimated and underestimated one another. Washington assumed he held the half-king in the palm of his hand, that he fully understood the Indians' motives, and not least of all, that the half-king could muster the substantial Indian force Virginia and the Ohio Company needed to evict a thousand Frenchmen from their land. For his part, the half-king assumed he could use the callow commander as a means of raising and manipulating the large English force he needed to evict the French. Neither man fully understood the other, and both hoped to gain more than either had to offer. So the idea that the half-king dramatically assassinated the French envoy as a helpless George Washington stood by shivering from fear seems more like a product of creative writing than of history. Besides, Washington's letters immediately following the battle testify to a man who is far from traumatized by what he witnessed at the battle. I can with truth assure you, I heard bullets whistle, and believe me, there was something charming in the sound. Why then did PBS film the story in such a misleading way? Well, there could be a few reasons. The demands of production caused the filmmakers to take shortcuts. They thought this version was maybe more exciting. Or maybe they just didn't care and they were trying to get the thing done on time. I don't really know, but I, I do think that there was at least one other motive. I think that they wanted to make George Washington look bad. Here's one of the first scenes from the film. The French and Indian War made him the leader he was. But the day it all began, there was nothing heroic about the father of his country. Why does PBS want to make George Washington look bad? Well, it's always more exciting to watch a documentary about a flawed hero than a perfect one. Maybe the filmmakers were trying to keep up with the trend in recent years of looking critically at the founders of this country. Personally, I totally support this trend. I think it's incredibly necessary to look back and criticize the figures of the past. But sometimes in our eagerness to reveal some spicy bombshell, we're willing to use whatever sources fit our narrative rather than follow the evidence wherever it may lead. Had PBS taken this route in its documentary, they would have had to concede that the detail about the half-king killing the envoy is dubiously sourced at best. But they needed to make Washington look like he was double-crossed, and frankly, I feel like they actually ended up playing into an anti-Indian stereotype. Unfortunately, my research turned up resources exclusively from the British and the French, so I'm not really in a position to tell you the story from Tana Charison's point of view. But next time PBS wants to make George Washington look bad, they can just film a documentary about how he treated his slaves. We also know that Washington did use several types of punishments on enslaved people, including physical punishments like whipping. 
Another type of punishment that Washington used was sale to another plantation. And he also used sale as a threat to others whose behavior he didn't like. And there are plenty of other controversies involving George Washington, from his ruthless pursuit of an escaped slave named Ona Judge, to his massive anti-Indian campaign of 1779 that resulted in the destruction of over 40 Iroquois villages. Remember, the Half King's nickname for George Washington was Konotokarias, destroyer of towns. But as for the tale of Homoville Glen, it turns out to be less of a gotcha than PBS leads you to believe. In fact, the more I read about the story, the more I was kind of impressed with what George Washington was able to accomplish at such a young age. If he can be criticized for anything here, it's that he probably attacked the French a little too early in the game. Reinforcements did not arrive in time to aid Washington's troops when the French retaliated, and Washington was forced to face a superior force of French and Indian warriors all by himself. He was able to withstand the assault and escape with his life, but many of his troops died, and it was a hard lesson in the importance of timing in warfare. So with what little we know about what actually happened, and with all the conflicting accounts out there, can we actually blame George Washington for starting this war? Maybe that's going a little too far, but was his attack the spark that caused the war? I'd have to say, yes. 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 Screw it. Yes. Yes. Of course, there were other factors outside of Washington's control, tensions between the French and British settlers that's been brewing and brewing long before he entered the story. And had Washington not attacked at Humonville Glen, probably some other incident somewhere else would have caused the war. But the decision to launch that specific attack was ultimately Washington's. And it was that specific attack that caused the French and Indian War. And it's for that reason that I would say yes, in fact. George Washington did start a world war. But that's just my two cents. What do you think? Do you know about any other sources out there? Or do you have anything else you might want to say about this? Is there something I missed? Put your thoughts in the comments section below. Remember that documentaries, even this one, always fall short of telling the full story and should always be conversation starters, not conversation enders. So put your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to like, like, like this video, subscribe and become a donor on patreon.com today. Links below in the description. Thanks everybody. The story of Humonville Glen continued to appear throughout George Washington's life, often as a weapon in the hands of his critics, including during his presidency. We're used to thinking of President Washington as a universally revered figure, but in fact, by the time he became president, he had amassed no short list of enemies. One of them was Benjamin Franklin Bach, the grandson of Benjamin Franklin. Bach was editor-in-chief of an anti-Washington newspaper, which regularly denounced America's first president as a dotard and a wannabe king. When Washington suddenly announced his retirement from politics in 1796, the smears about his kingly ambitions fell flat. So, in the final months of his administration, Bach's journal torpedoed the outgoing president's legacy, dredging up every one of his past controversies. Unsurprisingly, the incident at Humoville Glen came up. Bach's version of the story portrayed innocent Frenchmen desperately waving a flag of truce as the bloodthirsty Washington pounced on them, then cruelly and deliberately executed the French envoy after he'd surrendered. It had all the drama of the PBS documentary, only this time, the Half King was not the aggressor. Washington was. I wonder what PBS's documentary would have looked like had they used Benjamin Franklin Bach as their primary source. Always remember to check your sources, folks. Otherwise, you may end up just perpetuating some age-old drama that has little to do with real history. <laughs>